angry and from the internet. The reason I say that is for many years in my life, I have worked with many different types of people on the internet. I've worked with governments, I've worked with musicians, books, magazines, causes, developers, designers, advertisers, and now I work with creators of products and entertainment. Helping them use this magical technology to create an impact. You might have noticed that the internet has completely changed the way we do things in the past 10 years. It's made things easier, it's made things more accessible. This talk is not about that. This talk is about trying to build a better internet, trying to expand the scope and the application of the internet to people beyond the urban mass, and how, how we can take it to people who are just finding out about this magical technology. I was very fortunate to have progressive parents who gave me access to the internet way back in 97. Internet time at that time was very regulated because you couldn't make or receive phone calls while the internet was connected, which meant that most of my internet browsing time was late at night. One of my personal victories at that time was convincing my parents that I wasn't wasting time on the internet, that I was using it productively. You know, because when you browse the internet for so long and you get rack up 10,000 rupee bills, that's not a very appreciated phenomenon in a middle class household. However, I am thankful for that exposure early on in life. Because if you notice it, it's the kids who are the people who seem to intuitively know how to use the internet. Nobody ever gave them formal education about how to send an email, or to use IM, or to use Twitter. But kids do teach their grandparents how to email. They teach their parents how to use social networks, or how to download movies. It is at this confluence of culture and technology where kids have taken the lead and are teaching more and more people how to use the internet is where we find ourselves looking at expanding the scope of this internet to people who haven't yet <coughs> Sorry, haven't yet found this technology. There are about 300 million people using the internet in India. It's a resource and a medium for all of them. This number is expected to double in the next five years. Mobile first isn't just a buzzword in corporate boardrooms anymore. It's a way of life for people. It's where millions of people in India are discovering new things. With the explosion of languages on the internet, the opportunity for us reaching out to these people in India is huge. And that's what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to share with you a few lessons that I've got about the internet and about how we can expand its scope and application to people who could really, really use it. This brings us to lesson number one. Forgive the mislabeled slide. The internet is art. Ever since the beginning, the internet has given us many, many new ways of expression. It's given us tweets, video, short videos, GIFs, emojis, memes. The internet has enabled this sort of expression that was very, very difficult to mainstream before. When you think about it really, the internet expresses itself as a gigantic piece of realist art where all of us are connected. Every single action that each one of us takes on the internet has a butterfly effect to how the future of the internet and this technology is shaped. Every click, every search, every like is documented and informs your view speeds. It is on the internet that culture, expression, commerce, technology and algorithms come together to help make magic. It is high time that we now start viewing the internet as a gigantic piece of this realist art that's constantly evolving and constantly changing and thus taking cognizance of our own actions on what, about what's happening on the internet. Brings me to lesson number two, which is the internet is niche at scale. The internet today, let me just take you back to a simple thought experiment before, we, before I talk about how the internet is niche at scale. Go back to a time where you didn't have the internet and try and verify a fact. Any fact. Your friend tells you something interesting, you doubt its veracity, how do you verify it? If you, have, if you have a book or an encyclopedia, you may, you may find it in there. You might have to ask an expert, but access is limited because you can't just write to them on Twitter. The internet's philosophy is that of democracy. The internet has democratized information. Now all the information in the world is at your fingertips. It's democratized commerce. Today, if you're sitting in Detroit and want to buy leather goods from Dharavi, that is possible. Earlier, it wasn't. This niche of scale nature 
of the internet is something that has connected people and information together and made it possible for what was not mainstream before to find a voice. The implications of this on society have been far reaching as well. Today, the conversations that we are having around racism, feminism, casteism, intersectionality are all being pushed because the internet has given minorities a voice which the mainstream has shunned them from. This niche and scale nature of the internet has been applied by companies to, which were started out as small communities. Facebook started just for a community of Harvard graduates. Today it's, the, it's one of the biggest companies in the world. This concept of being niche at scale has been refined over and over and over again, bringing more and more people into the fold, developing features and products for these people depending on their needs. This is something that we need to do in India and start building products for people who haven't yet discovered the internet the same way that we did, who don't know what Yahoo Chat looked like, who have only found WhatsApp. Supporting their languages, supporting the conditions in which they use the internet is something that will help us democratize this phenomenon even further, taking the concept of niche art further, niche that's scale further. The third lesson is that the internet is a skill. How many of you have had a conversation with your Uber driver that goes something like this? Hello? Yeah, where are you? Oh, you've gone too far. You were supposed to take a left three lefts ago. How long will it take? Oh, there's no U-turn there. Oh, it's going to take forever. Both of you have Google Maps on your phone. Almost all of us learned how to read maps in school. How is it that there still exists this kind of skill gap when we're using technology to help simplify our lives? It's simply because nobody's trained the Uber driver to use maps to its full potential, and nobody's trained you to use your phones and improve the accuracy of your location. This upskilling of how to use the internet is going to be a critical differentiator in how India presents itself to the world. Another area of improvement where we need to think about educating women using the internet is critical. It's an area that we need to do more. Of the gender gap of about 450 million people online, India contributes about 42%. Think about that. That's nearly 200 million women who are not using the internet who come from here. Also, India has one of the lowest rates of women participating in the job economy. Skilling women to get online may just revive the economy for us. How do, we, how do we look at this in a way that helps us understand why this difference in how the internet is being taught to people exists? Well, the internet was, is being built in Palo Alto or Singapore or Bangalore, while the internet is being used in Thane and Kalyan and Nagpur. We need to become more inclusive in how we develop for, for these people so that they are able to use the internet to unlock its fullest potential. Today, young people are changing the way jobs and fame is defined. How many of you know someone who's a superstar on Instagram? How many of you know a 25 year old who's a billionaire because of a company that they found? How many of you know who Priya Warrior is who has more Instagram followers than the founder of Instagram? The internet has completely changed this landscape for us and we need to do more to make sure that we're allowing more and more people to get online and change and unlock the potential that the internet holds for them. And finally, I want to talk about something that you might have heard, that content is king, context is queen, but the data are taxes. We've all, all heard content is king somewhere, right? Some of us heard it in school, some of us heard it at work, some of us heard it at the movies. But the internet has brought about an application of context to this content. Let me give you an example. How many of you here know, know Kendall Jenner is? Do you know Kendall Jenner? Yeah. yeah. A couple of years ago, Pepsi released an ad where Kendall Jenner gave a can of Pepsi to riot police. Right? It was a massive riot where she walks in and she hands a can of Pepsi and that seems to somehow tie the riot over. In another time and space, this would have been hailed as a triumph of advertising, you know, bringing people together over the sweeter things in life. But in 2017, where the internet was yelling context and the internet was yelling Black Lives Matter, Pepsi was called tone deaf. Pepsi had to withdraw the advertising. That's the power of context. But what gets lost in all of this is what are the taxes of using this? The taxes are user data. 
Your own data is the tax you pay to use the internet. Your own data is the oil that lubricates the parts of the internet and keeps the engine running. The internet is vast and huge, but it's personalized for all of you. Your newsfeed is different from mine, your search results are different from mine, and all of this is powered by data. This explosion of user data has a dark side to it. Elon Musk might evangelize machine learning and AI, but so does the Chinese government. Publicly available user data is one thing, but private take, using private data by governments and private companies to thwart actions that do not suit their objectives is, a, is something that puts us at the risk of surveillance, propaganda, and censorship. The future of how we use the internet and how we build it for people who are just about finding this new technology heavily depends on how we regulate this data and its usage. While we've made huge advances in how the internet is used to develop products that make our lives easier, the law and its applications still lag far behind. So there you have it. Those are my four major lessons on how we can build a better internet for people who are just about finding it. It's a duty and a responsibility for, technolo for technologists, marketers, and thinkers to, to be more inclusive in how we use the internet. I'm not saying that these, are, these rules are exhaustive. There are rules that apply to specific communities. There are rules that apply to specific use cases of people who are online. But with these four rules, we can go around building a better internet. I'm Vinny from the internet. Thank you for listening.